Ho, ho, ho. It's our last episode before Christmas, and the Raptors delivered us a big old lump of coal. Welcome back to Raptors NBA podcast. The Raptors coming off a another loss, this time to the Nuggets. Uh, on this episode, we're bringing in the human trade machine, Brandon Hayes, to help us break down some potential Raptors trades, uh, and we'll break down the game and the rest of the NBA. I'm Andy Redding. That's Alex Drogan. Welcome back to Raptors NBA podcast. Alex, the Raptors, losing to the Nuggets. Are you surprised? Absolutely not. Absolutely not surprised. And listen, I think we got off on the wrong note on the last podcast. We've had a few people argue in the comments based on whether or not it seems like people think I don't like Nikola Jokic when I obviously do. I like him. I like I'm just saying I would rather watch Steph Curry than Nikola Jokic play. But we <laughs> saw an absolute gem of a game from him last night. This guy does it all, but it's not flashy. Yesterday, he's in the lane. He's kicking it out to people. He's way too powerful for anybody on the Raptors defensive line to get a stop on him. And he just he just went to work. He was cooking. The Raptors brought it down to about five points with a couple minutes left in the fourth. And then he put it away. He had that random last second three point toss up from the three. And I think that closed the game. So honestly, it was all Nikki Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets are looking good, especially with Jamal Murray back. What do you think of Jamal? Jamal's nice. Jamal loves seeing him back. First game in town after winning the chip. Uh, yeah, you know I'm high on Jamal. I, I've always been high on Jamal. Don't even start with me about Jamal. Uh, he was nice. Uh, as far as you, the Raptors, you actually, you actually were saying that Jamal Murray was the best Canadian athlete in the NBA way before Shea Gilgis was on the scene. So you were, you were saying that he was better than Andrew Wiggins when I'm I'm still on the Andrew Wiggins train to be honest with you but still kind of kind of but yeah Jamal went for what do you go for 26 assists six rebounds he's all the way back he's all the way back they are a legit contender the west is just a juggernaut it's like the it's like the 2008 2010 west it's just like every team could could win it is like one through eight you could see winning if not more uh we mentioned Jokic his big game. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone struggled a bit guarding him. Our counterpart to Jokic, a European big man of our own, Jakob Pertl. Uh, he did not play during crunch time. This is getting ugly with Jakob. Look, this is exactly what I was saying before. We just don't have enough size. The Raptors are small. What Nikola Jokic did to everybody on our front court is exactly what he does to the majority of teams in the league. But the problem is we don't don't have a second big man to throw at him. Uh, Every single time Jokic got the ball on the block, he either posted down, all the way down, hit a little hook over the left shoulder, did a little layup, had a little runner. Um, There's nobody who could stop him. Yeah, Jakob's line wasn't the best. I was just actually looking at it. It's four points, two blocks. Uh, three assists and only five rebounds. So for Jakob, that's a tiny line. That's horrendous. But again, I think it's more the testament of how good the Joker is as opposed to how bad Jakob Pertl is. You know what uh, I mean? It's been a tr- it's been a troubling trend for Jakob though. Last here's a super stat for you. A super troubling stat. Last seven games with Jakob off the court, the Raptors are minus. Sorry, with him on the floor, they are minus forty nine. With him off the floor, they're plus twenty three. They are better with him not playing. And they traded a first round draft pick for this guy. This could go down as the, at the moment, it is the worst trade in Masai Ujiri's history. <laughs> is it not? Name a worse one. I don't know. I'd have to, t- <laughs> have to take a look at it. This it's, is the overreaction podcast. Listen. No, it is. It is the no, worst. It's, it's sitting the Raptors it's... back a year. The Raptors are losing games. They don't even have their own first round draft pick this year. There's no point to the season. Andy, Jakob is a plus on most nights. The problem is, like, he... What? He's an average center. He's just a mid-guy you could sign as a free agent for $10 million a year. You don't need to give draft capital. And sign okay, I, I see what you're saying. Maybe they did give up a little too much for him. They did. But I think, in for the most cases, he's a walking double-double for the Raptors. So I just think he needs a bit more help. I think that's the main problem. We don't have another big man next to him. He's literally... He's not even that big in terms of size and in terms of weight. So we need another big man who's 
who needs to be next to him at all times. That's the I think that's the biggest problem with Jakob because he gets put into these situations where he gets uh, switched on to smaller guards and then the, the 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 man whoever gets the ball just dominates that guard inside. Do you know what I mean? Or like if he's playing defense on another big guy, a lot of big guys are going to work on the Raptors down low doing little little passes down low. So it's it's hard to get for Jakob to be the only center on the team. That like that's the problem. Jakob is mid. Okay, but no, what's not a first you don't trade a first round pick for a guy like that. It's so in, it's inexcusable. Which big man would you rather have than Jakob Pertl at that same price? Any free agent any year can give you 10 and 8 every game. I think that's really easy to say for you right now, but I think if he has a bit more help on the front Cody, line, Cody Zeller would give you the same. Oh my thing. god. You're going to right now you're going to compare Cody Zeller to Jakob Pertl. You can get him for way cheaper, and he would provide almost the same value. App, zero percent chance. Cody Zeller's never, never <laughs> had a double double in his life. I don't know. He probably has. Um, one, one other thing on this game. First of all, this is a really interesting game to watch because, like I said, Denver was leading the entire time, and then the Raptors brought it to about five points within the last couple of minutes, and then it was a really big push. But one thing, man, Scotty Barnes once again. I know we've talked about him ad nauseum on this podcast, but he is absolutely dominant on both ends of the floor. His line was 30 points, 10 rebounds, five assists. He shot 13 from 22 from the field, one for five from three only. Um, But he's just a dominant force. He gets to every space that he wants to get to. He pulls up on people. He backs people down, and he's perfect on either end of the pick and roll situation. Scotty's the man. I think he's making more of a push into that all-star slot. What do you think? If you if he keeps putting up 30 pieces like every other game, yeah. He'll he'll catch the attention of the league. Yeah, definitely. And he's putting up 30 pieces against a, a good defense in Denver. Like they have some big guys on that front line and they like to mix things up. So it's like he's putting up a 30 piece in a bunch of different ways, not just um, you know, not just scoring inside, not just shooting. He's like he's doing everything. And the assist numbers are, you know, they're great as well. I don't know. Scotty Barnes. Just just imagine if he had a starting, a real starting point guard playing with him. Imagine how much better he'd be. So now you're completely off Dennis Schroeder. Uh, I think he's a great backup point guard. I, I <laughs> He is, he's come back down to earth and I think he's hurting the team in the final minutes. And I don't think he's, he doesn't shoot that well. I just think if the starting point guard for the Raptors was Fred Van Vliet, Kyle Lowry, uh, Scotty Barnes, would his numbers would be even better. No, I don't disagree with you at all. I don't know who's out there for us. Um, same thing with maybe a bit of shooting. We need a new starting point guard. We need some shooting and we need some size, but that's it. <laughs> um, we don't need long uh, threes and fours. We got those. So we got 10 of those. We're talking about everything that we need. Um, so I think it's pr- a perfect time to bring on our trade machine expert, Brandon Hayes. Bring Should we, let's put him on the call. All right, here we go. We've brought on the human trade machine, Brandon P. Hayes. So, Brandon, first of all, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you're deeply entrenched in this Raptors and NBA trade community. You're all over the place here. Um, we've been talking before you came on about what the Raptors need to do to make their lineups a little bit better. Andy, for some reason, came off the top rope saying that we need a better point guard at this point. We all know we need to p- potentially trade Pascal Siakam, probably OG and Nobi. We need a big man. We need some shooting. Off the top of your head, first of all, what do you think the Raptors should do first? And can you give us a few trade scenarios? Most definitely. The idea I toss around most often is consolidation of the three wings three fours however you want to say it in Barnes OG and Pascal there's a ton of talent when it works it's amazing the problem is it's a lot of overlap so you're um, suppressing everyone's ceiling by doing this so first off Masai has to make a decision a tough one is it a Barnes Siakam combo is it a OG Barnes combo or is it Barnes leading the way with a totally new roster after a tank rebuild retool? There's lots of options there. 
There's financial restrictions in a lot of places that have to be explored. The number one idea you could think of is trading Pascal. The issue being there has to be value in a player for the receiving team. Pascal is on an expiring deal. He's talked about testing free agency. So any team that wants to acquire him will have to understand that he will likely test free agency, see all the options that are out there, which unfortunately lowers his value. Now, as Masai is shopping these players, which we have to assume he is because any GM is shopping almost every player on their roster all season long to test their value to see where it is. One organization values you at multiple picks, another at a specific player you like. Some people value your guy more than others, and you have to find the right fit for both your team and your future. I look to teams that have cap space, a willingness to sign Pascal in the future as the best possible tra trade candidates for him, because if a team has a feeling they're going to re-sign Pascal after this season, they're going to give up more for him now. If some team views him as strictly a rental for the playoffs, you're not going to get a lot of value out of him. And that's the unfortunate reality with trading guys on expiring deals. Okay, wait, 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 Brandon, Brandon. So let's let me ask you, what is the what are some specific scenarios for Pascal? Like we've heard of Indiana, like we've heard of OKC. What are we thinking about in terms of uh, Indiana, Raptors, Siakam? Yeah, I think you're looking at teams that have young players on the rise where Siakam can be added to that mix and accentuate what those young players are doing and maybe not be the number one when he gets there, but the number two. So the first one that I think we've heard a lot about was Atlanta. And Atlanta has a lot of intriguing wing pieces. They've got a couple of bigs, if that's what we're looking for. They've got guards. They've got most of their own picks. So if you're looking at something with DeAndre Hunter, A.J. Griffin, Jalen Johnson, those guys are replacement level wings that can come here, come off the bench, provide value. They have uh, immense talents that we're looking at that are plug and play for the Raptors. They don't give you the types of highs that Siakam does. But again, if we are consolidating and building around Barnes, giving him more supporting players, you cannot have too many athletic wings, three and D guys. Atlanta has those in abundance. Then you can look at some picks to mix in there and you can get a trade done with an Atlanta. Uh, if you look at a team like Indiana, They've got a young big that has not really seen the court in Jairus Walker. He was a number eight pick overall. So there was a lot of value there. There's a lot of um, skill development there. And Raptors have shown that they can develop young bigs. So there's an opportunity to bring in a player like that. Atlanta, or sorry, Indiana has a number of wings as well that could complement this Raptors team. Brennan, They're hold on. Come on, man. Jairus Walker. Jairus Walker is 6'7". He's averaging 3.8 points a game, 1.5 boards, 1.4 assists. Like, come on. We don't need a 6'7 big. We need a real big. Andy? Or how about a guy with some shooting on the Pacers like Andrew Nemhart? That sounds nice, doesn't it? Bring him home. Again, you're looking at a centerpiece of a deal here, and that Indiana team doesn't have a lot of big budget contracts, so you're going to have to piece together a number of players, a Nemhart a Jairus Walker, I think the most value you're getting from Indiana is going to be in the picks. I don't think that Indiana team is constantly going to be in the top five. So those picks are going to be probably late teens, early 20s. And you'd want to get a number of those for Pascal. Again, you're pushing it up against a team that's looking at him as a rental. The Indiana team has a number of guys in their front court, uh, Miles Turner, Isaiah Jackson, uh, Jairus Walker, Obi Toppin. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Are, well, those are players who are looking to be paid in the next couple of years. Uh, Indiana just acquired Obi Toppin. He fits great with Carlisle's uh, run and gun pace. I don't think that's a player that you're looking to move if you're Indiana. I think Carlisle's um, reluctance to play rookies plays into why Jairus Walker is not spending a lot of time on the court. And I believe he's playing for the uh, Fort Dwayne Mad Ants. And getting some minutes there, it's hard to look at his stats now and compare them. Yes, he's an undersized big, but with the league getting a little smaller, focusing more on shooting, getting further away from the basket, I think you can look at a player like that and see uh, see a big man, see a four in Jairus Walker. And okay, Brandon, hold on, hold on. Let me just, just interrupt you for one second. So Andrew Nemhard, another guy 
who he's good in terms of energy. He's an energy player. I've definitely liked him. He had a bunch of those battles in that finals game against the Lakers, which is the first time I've really gotten to see him. But the guy's 6'4", 191. He's a, he's a small. So basically what we're saying is if we're going with Indiana, we're going with some first-round picks. That, that's that's the number one thing we're looking at. We're looking at picks, correct? I think you're also probably going to get uh, Buddy Heald included in that uh, deal as well. I think Heald is on a contract that – uh, can be combined with some of these other players we've mentioned to make the dollars and cents work. The Raptors then get a shooter, which every team is looking for. Um, I think Heald is looking for a payday as well. And I think it'd be easier for the Raptors to consider paying Heald into the offseason or extending him at once you're alleviating that front court log jam. So I think with that, with a few young players, with some picks, that's an attractive uh, package for the Raptors. Now, do the Pacers feel the same way? How much draft capital are they willing to give up? Are they willing to push their chips all in this year, disrupting what they have now, which is a team that made it to this, the final of the NBA Cup and is competing in a very densely populated middle of the road in the East? So does Indiana think that it's time to make a step in the contender direction? Does Oklahoma City think that their young pieces are ready to be um, added to with a veteran, an all NBA player. Wait, 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 Brennan, before you get into OKC, I want to ask Andy, Andy, what do you think about Nemhard? What do you think about um, Miles Turner? We've talked about this already, but am I the only one who still likes Miles Turner in this entire that'd be, league? That would be for salary matching. I don't think the Raptors would focus their future on old man, Miles Turner. Like How I, old is he? What do you mean old man? Is he not upwards of 30? No, he cannot be 30. He's been in the league since they were playing the Raptors in the playoffs. He's 27. 27. I don't know. Don't you want a younger guy with a little more upside and he hits his prime the same time as Scotty does? I, I mean, I guess. I don't know. Brandon, what do you think of Miles Turner? To me, with Hurdle in the Raptors rotation, I don't think you have enough um, big man minutes for both those guys. That Pertle don't... got cooked last night. Pertle got cooked last night. Like he gets cooked a lot of nights because he's the only big man. I think anybody getting cooked by the Joker is not a blemish on their resume personally, but... Um... He doesn't just get cooked <laughs> by the Joker. He's gotten cooked by quite a few guys based on him having to switch on to people, him not being able to like just fully play defense because he has to come help every time. We just talked about this, actually. <laughs> the solution to that is not to bury his uh, $20 million contract on the bench by acquiring another big. If you're looking at uh, including him in deals and moving him along, I don't know what his value is uh, around the league. I don't know if the Raptors were competing with anyone when they signed him to his deal in the offseason. They obviously loved him, gave up a first-round pick for him, and wanted to re-sign him. Does he fit long term with Scotty Barnes? That's another question that Masai has to answer. Is it worth acquiring another big? The Raptors could change their focus and look to go solely for a big to complement the remaining wings that stay. Is is Miles Turner that big? I don't know. Miles Turner has had limited success, but has recently found more playing with Tyrese Halliburton, not being a focal point of an offense. Can he come in here and be a role player contributing piece? Yes, I'm sure he can. Is it financially prudent to do that with Pirtle on the books? Hard to say. I would argue that right now you have to have multiple big men on a team to win or compete for a championship. Look at Denver. They won because of their big. LA, massive team. You know, you look at all of these contending teams who are actually contending and like, look at, look at Boston, even Boston's a massive team now that they've added poor Zingas, like their, their average heights, probably like what, like six ten on that starting lineup. So I think like, I think you need a couple of bigs. I just don't think the Raptors can win just having Pirtle around. Andy, what do you think of that? The Raptors have two incredibly valuable trade chips that they're probably not going to have again in the near future with Pascal and OG. I don't think it's the time to find a center that works with the team better. Don't you want to pick up a guy like the Pacers picked up Halliburton, like the Thunder picked up Shea Gilgis? Don't you want this young guy who's a little undervalued by their current team and can grow into a superstar? 
No, I would agree. So who would that one guy be? Or who would those 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 chips be? Let's move on to OG. Like, what are we thinking there? Brendan? I think with OG, you're looking at a lot of the same teams that are interested in Pascal. But I think you're looking at a lesser return because of Pascal's past as a all-NBA player, an all-star player. I think every team in the league could use OG on their team without a doubt. How much are they willing to give up is going to be the issue. The uh, contract extension that the Raptors were able to offer OG was not close to what he can see on the open market. So he's another player who will be testing free agency. So if you're trading him to a team, you are looking for teams that would be looking to lock him up long term so that they value him very high. Uh, a team like OKC, I think they'd be less inclined to go for OG than Pascal. Pascal moves the needle a bit more for them. He becomes another cog in the machine, and they've got a lot of those players with your Kaysan Wallace's and your Lugans Dortz. So I don't know that OG really sticks out there. Same thing with Atlanta. You're looking at DeAndre Hunter and AJ Griffin, and you're getting a slight upgrade when you go to OG, but how much are you willing to give back? Now, the bind that Masai is in is similar to last season when he let Fred walk for nothing. Is yeah. holding out for the best deal the best option when you lose them for nothing? So I'm looking at a player like OG, and I'm thinking matching salary and at least one pick with light protection, hopefully two first-round picks with protection. I would take two protected first-round picks and matching salary from almost any team at this point, add to the asset cupboard. Don't let these guys leave for nothing. We see how Fred is playing on Houston, and you look at a player like that, that's a valuable player, and we saw nothing in return for him. I don't want to see that for these two players. Again, I think Atlanta, Indiana, OKC, these second-tier teams – that are looking to build out their depth and add to their current roster of wings would love to get an OG on their team. Can we get two picks from them? That's the negotiating that Masai would have to pull right now. Brandon, if Masai Ujiri and Bobby Webster let OG and or Pascal walk to the end of their contract, they don't trade him for anything and they just walk in free agency. Is that a fireable offense after letting Freddie do it last year? That seems like a, or mismanagement of assets? I think that in other situations, yes. I think Masai has earned himself more than enough goodwill with the championship, with developing multiple players, that he's never had a full rebuild, if you will. And as much as he's angling towards that, if you start next year with Scotty Barnes and the pieces on this team, it's going to be a tough year after that. Is that the is next year the first year of the rebuild? Does management say to Masai, you've got three years? I would hope so because again, I think he's one of the better GMs in the league. It's been a tough situation for him when Kawhi, Marcus Sol, Serge Ibaka all leave for relatively nothing. Danny Green, you can include in there as well. And then to turn around that very next year, that team's competitive. Year after that. We kind of bottomed out, got our uh, next superstar in Scotty, and then have been on that mediocre tread, uh, treadmill for the past couple of years. I think taking two steps back is a viable option without any assets back from OG and Siakam and our pick going to the Spurs most likely this year. That is a very... It's close to a fireable offense. I'm partial to Masai, so maybe my bias showing right there, but I don't think that that's something you let them go for. Can I throw a name out there for you boys? <laughs> throw it. Can I throw a name out there for the boys? Throw here? it into the wind. I'm going to throw it into the wind right now. What about RJ Barrett for OG and Anobi straight up? Straight up. Who says no? R.J. Barrett, let me make a case for this. R.J. Barrett is like 7th or 8th on the Knicks roster in 4th quarter minutes. Andy and I were at the game last week, and he was sitting for most of the 4th. That's one thing we legitimately noticed the entire game. You know, he's not uh, one of Tibbs' favorite players right now. It seems like Tibbs favors some other people on that team. Now, 
You look at the Knicks. They're extremely competitive, right? They're doing. They're playing really well this season. Uh, Jalen Brunson's having an All Star year. Julius Randle's playing really well as well. RJ right now his numbers. He's averaging eighteen point five points, four boards, two point five assists. If you look at OG, he's averaging the exact same number of boards and assists as RJ, and just averaging three or sorry, averaging four points less than RJ Barrett. Okay, now. Obviously, on the defensive end, OG Ananobi significantly better. So I think that that's what makes it appealing for the Knicks. And I don't know. Are the Knicks off on R.J. Barrett a little bit? I think that's a... an a, a, R.J. coming home, coming to Canada, coming to Toronto. You have that storyline. People would love R.J. Barrett in Canada. You know, he'd get the keys. Obviously, Scotty's first in the car, but whatever. That's, that's a passenger seat right there for <laughs> R.J. What do you guys think of that name? You're onto something. I mean, he's got three. He's like he's a locked in asset. He's got three more years left after this on his contract at like twenty seven mil a year. So it's not too expensive. Uh, I think you're kind of onto something there. Yeah, I like that for both teams. In that, if you look at that New York roster, it is guard heavy. Um, <clears throat> you've got Brunson, Grimes, uh, Quickly, Hart, DiVincenzo, and Barrett. So that's a that, and and Miles McBride too at the very bottom of that, but that's a lot of guard play, a lot of options, but almost too many. And the Knicks will probably love to get a little bit bigger, a little bit more size, and a little bit more defense. The Raptors again alleviating that log jam at the three four. I would like to see that accompanied by um, trying to move off of Gary Trent as well. Uh, I think there's minutes to oh, be had. Oh, Gary there. Trent Jr. Andy's least favorite Raptor of all time, maybe? We're done We're done with him. Um, if with you him. can get value for him, yes. Um, I would also, like so, sorry, Brandon, you just went through the Knicks lineup. It's pretty funny that all Jalen Brunson, uh, Julius Randle, and R.J. Barrett are left-handed. Maybe there's something going on there. Maybe you can just switch that up. Get a right-handed player in there. I would love to see R.J. Barrett on the Raptors. <laughs> I would love. I would love that. I think, yeah, I think for many reasons, bringing home a Canadian, um, balancing the roster out a bit more. A good Canadian little, boy. Yeah. Having a little bit more um, downhill presence in uh, yeah. RJ Barrett. Good word. Downhill presence. And I would like to see RJ get get control of the second unit. I think uh, Scotty Barnes leading the way and uh, seating that second unit to RJ Barrett. I would love to see that. Wait, wait, I, you're not saying he's going to come off the bench. You're saying like if... No, I, th I think at a certain point, if you get him on the team, you're you're leading with Scotty Barnes as your main ball handler playmaker. But I think when Barnes goes to the bench, you have an opportunity to hand over that second unit to RJ Barrett and give him a bit more freedom than he's ever seen in New York and seeing what he has. And uh, a three-year contract, a young player, I think that's the kind of um, opportunity you give a guy and, you know, it's make or break. Maybe R.J. Barrett is forever a sixth man, but I wouldn't mind finding that out by giving him the opportunity to lead a second unit, com complement Scotty Barnes on the closing units and opening units. I, I like that trade. I don't know if New York values Barrett very high. You see Tibbs not giving him a ton of minutes, so obviously he's not 100% uh, sold on him. Tibbs is going to love a defensive menace like OG. That's what I'm saying. Bring the, the boy home. Bring him home. Andy, bring the maple think? mom. Bring the maple mamba home. You know, I thought about this when we were at the game the other the other night, and I was like, the, you know, you brought you brought it to our attention that he just wasn't on the floor. What's RJ wasn't on the floor whatsoever in the fourth quarter, and then I was like, man, the other day when I was thinking about all of this, I was like, who would be a good fit for for both sides? And I don't think. Like, I think both sides would benefit from that. Um, but having said that, do you think that Masai values OG even higher than RJ Barrett? Like, what are we thinking there? Because clearly last year there was like 17 first-round picks and 84 starting <laughs> starters for OG. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Does he value him too high? Yeah, the, the rumor was uh, Masai turned down three first-rounders from Memphis asking for a fourth. Will we what, know? What did your What did your sources tell you about that one? Uh, my <laughs> sources told me that Memphis was heavily in on OG, but the uh, the return was questionable. 
Now there'd have to be players going back and forth. Three picks to me seems like a lot. Asking for a fourth is like, this is, OG is not even Rudy Gobert. He's not an all defensive player. He's not an all defensive first team guy yet. And I don't think that that was ever in the mix. Obviously you want to get the most out of it. You want to wring the most out of your assets. Did he overplay his hand? Should he have taken the three picks if they were on the table? I think so. Yeah. The Raptors are going to have a hard time re-signing OG if that's what they want in the offseason, only because there are going to be teams out there who are going to throw money at him. I can see a San Antonio throwing money at an OG. That's a type of defense. San Antonio team. needs a point guard. That's the that's their number one um need. Right I don't doubt that. But their their reluctance to really play their only point guard this year shows me that they're not feeling a real sense of urgency on that. That might be something they look to the draft for. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the next couple of years, we're going to see more uh, point guards coming out. San Antonio with numerous picks will have a chance to draft one or two of those on the same timeline, but a consistent veteran that, doesn't take away anything from your offense, brings more to it as a complimentary player, shooter, slasher, and then just a, a an A bordering on A-plus defender. That's going to help that young San Antonio team come together a bit more. And again, they're going to have that kind of cap space. There's been mentioned that uh, Detroit would like uh, an OG on their team, which for a team that's lost 23 and counting games in a row, they need more talent. That is evident in Detroit. Can the Raptors swing a trade with Detroit now, knowing that Detroit's got that cap space to make a move for OG in the offseason? Let's say put put a deal in front of Detroit. Hey, Cunningham for OG straight up? <laughs> Who says no? no <laughs> I think you're more likely looking at um, some combination of Ivy, is who I'd be looking at who's not getting a ton of minutes in Detroit currently. Um, no, Isaiah's I don't want I don't want him. I don't want him. Fair enough. Okay, wait, but wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, Brandon. Sorry, just to, let me reel it back for a second. So if you were to rank the teams that are the most likely scenario, that's the most likely scenario for OG to go to, what are the top three teams that you're thinking? I think, again, personally, I think... Oklahoma City needs to make a trade. They have far too many assets, far too many players to pay everyone, to make space on their roster for them. They are the team in most need of a consolidation trade. And because they are being so successful right now, it makes sense for them to be looking at um, uh, players who are available who can actually move the needle. And I think OG moves the needle on every team. Um, I think that Indiana team also needs more defense they are the highest scoring team in the league, but they're also like leaking points. So that team could definitely use a stabilizing defensive presence. I think Atlanta doesn't really know what they want at this point. I think they want a higher caliber of player, but I wouldn't discount them for making a run at OG as well. Why not bring in DeJounte Murray? What about that? That's a, that situation's not working out. Andy, you want a new point guard, Okay. John Tamer, I don't know what his salary is right now, but I'm sure it, it could we could bring it close to matching up. Like, would you take DeJounte Murray for OG and a, like a pick? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard, it's, hard to see, it's hard to see where the value is there because unless Atlanta wants to get off the Deontay Murray money, trading a player who's locked up for a number of years for a player who's an expiring contract, you're essentially um, pushing all of our risk to Atlanta. So if we get Deontay Murray and they lose OG, that's going to be a hard sell for them. And because of contract extension rules and whatnot, I don't think that OG is eligible to sign an extension in season anymore. I think that window has closed. So now you're asking Atlanta to take on tremendous amounts of risk for a player that we want. That's a hard trade to, to sell to Atlanta. Do we have to include draft capital then on our end to make that deal work? I'm I'm getting further and further away from what I want because I want this young team to be built around Scotty Barnes. We've already lost draft capital for next year. I'm not really interested in putting more draft capital out to get another player in. One more team for you. 
There was rumors coming out today uh, that the 76ers were looking at OG, keeping their eyes on him. Is that even feasible? Do they have young pieces? I think they have a few like distant first round picks, not in the near future. I, like, could that happen? It's hard because the uh, haul they got back in the James Harden uh, trade is veterans who are more win now. The Batums and the Covingtons are more likely for contenders. They're buyout candidates if they're included in any trades at this point. You're almost looking at taking back Tobias Harris in that scenario, and I don't think that's an issue or a, a, a player that the Toronto Raptors would really be interested in taking on. So as much as many teams, like I said, would be interested in OG, do they have the assets to bring him on? I don't think so. And I like don't see real assets on that Philadelphia team available assets on that Philadelphia team. That oh, you don't like you don't like Marcus Morris, Nicholas Batum, and Robert Covington. <laughs> Roco, not to not to make this Raptors team any better in the short. Order. No, that was that was a joke. No, if those three come on the team, they're they're going down to the G League. They're getting bought out. Um, <laughs> boys, let me ask you guys a question, Andy. Yes. You know that I've been sad about this over the last little while because of how mediocre the team is. Does it mediocre. make you sad? Does it make you sad that right now we're talking about trade scenarios where we'll have players that are two years away from two years away once again? Aren't you? Does that make you guys a little bit sad that we're getting into this rebuild phase? It's less gloomy than trying to get into the play-in tournament and getting knocked out in the first game and having no hope for the future. I like it's a necess- it's a necessary step, I believe. Brennan? Yeah, I think teams that are dedicating themselves to resets, reboots, however you want to phrase it, who don't have a star player, who don't have that anchor, that's depressing. When you're just like, let's clear the cupboard completely and start over from scratch. What we have now is a player that, to my eye at this point, looks like he's worthy of building around. When you already have that first step it's much easier to take your two steps back to take three steps forward. So do I hate the idea of losing? Yes. Am I willing to accept that a soft or potentially hard reboot is the way to go? Yeah, that's a couple years of pain, but it's a couple years of growth, watching a player hopefully turn into an all-star and with the right moves, and this is why I want to keep the Masai and Webster combination, give them picks. Let's stop, let's restock the cupboard and let's give them the opportunity to build a team around Scotty Barnes with very little salary implica- implications moving forward. If you can clear the books, build a team around Scotty, and it takes three years, I'm willing to I'm willing to wait those. Okay, years. okay, but let me ask you guys a question. Is Scotty Barnes willing to wait those three years? Because we've seen in the last like five, six years in the NBA where these players don't have that much patience as they used to. They don't care. They don't care anymore. Like if Scotty Barnes has to be sold on this idea of, oh, three years from now, we might be decent enough like to have a run at the playoffs. Like that's that's the problem at this point. I, I think I think we're forgetting that like Scotty Barnes is an ultra, ultra competitive dude. So being three years away from being three years away for Scotty Barnes is probably not ideal. I don't think that that's a guy who wants to be on a losing team. So I could see a scenario where if this takes a little too long, he'll be out. You can see Scotty Barnes requesting a trade. The happiest guy in the NBA. Doesn't complain. Just smiling all the time. You can see him souring on Toronto. Absolutely. If we don't Come win for on. three years, if, we're, if, we don't, if we don't even sniff the playoffs for three years, of course I see that. That happens all the time. He's a competitive dude, man. It's not like we're not talking about a guy who's living in L.A. or a guy who's living in Atlanta or Miami, right? You're living in Toronto. We're forgetting about that. As much as I love the city, it's freezing outside. It's gloomy. You know, like a lot of these guys, I think if you're super competitive and you want to win, selling the idea to them that in two years we might be okay for the next three years, like he's not going to want to do that. That's my opinion. I think counterpoint to that is there's, you know, 30 franchises, meaning there's 30 cars and there's probably 60 to 100 dudes in the NBA who think that they should be driving the car. When you get that opportunity, 
you want to stick with that because you get traded. You don't know what's going to happen, right? You go to a team, you end up being second, third banana. You don't have that freedom. That freedom of leading a franchise keeps guys around, keeps guys getting their max deals, signing them. Now, yeah, if you see like only despair on the horizon, yeah, you're going to ask your way out. I've never heard that term, second or third banana. Like right now, Andy's the first banana on this podcast. I'm the second. You're the third. Is that what? Is that what we're saying? Andy's clearly the most talented here. I'm second, and then clearly you come in Stop. third. I'm kidding. Okay. Anyways. But the, these guys want to have their team. They want to be the decision maker, the, the big dog. Hold on, hold on. Team. Sorry. Did you just make that – did you make that term up? I've never heard that term before. Second or third banana? Have you heard this term, Andy? <laughs> I got to – like, wait. I got I to gotta finish this point. I Dude, like have it. You heard, have you heard this term? I feel like it's a thing. If not – Props to you, Brandon, for making up a term. I really like it. <laughs> I just, second or third banana, like, I don't understand. Like, is that – if you have three bananas, is when one banana is, like, the nicest and then the other two are, like, up for – or one's a little bruised? Is that what <laughs> – is that what that means? Like, I think the, the first banana eaten is always the nicest banana, and then it's a sliding scale after that. Okay. All right. Anyways, get, get back to what you were saying. I just <laughs> – you, I... you threw me right off. I don't even know what we're talking about at this point. I, I'm saying <laughs> – Scotty Barnes asking for a trade does not guarantee that Scotty Barnes goes to a team where he gets the keys to the, the car. If he's on this Toronto team, he knows that as long as Masai and Bobby Webster are here, they are building a team around him. I think that's, that's worth at least one contract, possibly two. So if you're telling me that Scotty Barnes comes up for a deal in the next couple of years and it's a max deal, I don't think he's pushing his way out because I think he, wants to be in charge of this team he wants to be the big dog and you're going to get four or five years worth of building around him in his next contract so this round takes two or three years to get through again we've got that pick going to the top six pick going to san antonio next year if that conveys then i don't believe we are owe any picks to anybody moving forward if we can get draft capital from gary trent og siakam deals these are things that we can use to build around Scotty Barnes. We've proven that we can find diamonds in the rough, your Freds, your Pascals, your OGs, and maybe you're taking a bit bigger swings on some of these to really hit home runs, but you're going to see, A, can Scotty Barnes lead a team? Can Masai find one more all-star companion for him at anywhere at any point in the draft? And can we cobble together small signings that complement this team? And when you are working with a more blank slate, if you make all these trades, it's easier to fit those guys into your roster. That's what I look forward to moving forward. And I hope Scotty Barnes does too, because I think Scotty Barnes looking at this as a multi-year project, not are we going to win a championship next year? I think that has to be broached with him and say like, listen, we're going to make you the driver we're going to take three to four years to make this work. Are you on board? Scotty Barnes yeah. is banana the first. Let's make him. All right, Andy, what do you think? Some good dialogue. A lot of, a lot of things to consider. A lot of bananas in the air to consider here. Just juggling bananas out here all day. <laughs> um, okay. The, hard, I don't know. the hardest fruit to juggle, guys. Any, anyone have anything else to add to that? Because we went pretty in-depth there. That was good. That was great. I'm... Personally, I like the idea of moving forward with a Barnes OG tandem. So you don't want to trade OG is what you're saying at all. Here, here's here's the dilemma with that. Pascal is going to be hard to get a lot of value from. I think if Masai commits to re-signing OG in the offseason for a large contract and commits to selling off Pascal at maybe 70 cents, maybe 80 cents on the dollar. I think that is the best move going forward. I think OG is much closer to Scotty's timeline. I think you've lost, you. the window is closed on getting a lot of value out of Siakam. I think a couple of draft pieces, one young controllable piece should be your goal. And then restarting with draft capital moving forward, Scotty and OG locked up. And a coach who wants to play a style of ball that fits both of their personalities. That's what I look forward to. Mm -hmm. Is 
is going to be hard to say goodbye to Siakam, yes. But I think that he's had a chance to be the number one guy, and he's shown that he is not capable of leading us deep into the playoffs as the number one guy. It's time to move on from that. I always wonder, like, wouldn't it be so interesting to just talk to Pascal and be like, man, where do you want to go? Like, where do you want to go, you know? Obviously, assuming it's like L.A., Miami, you know, somewhere in Texas. We'll find that out next summer. He will tell us where he wants to go. By where he yeah. signs. He's like, I'm sick and tired of these Toronto winters, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy, anything else? you want to wrap this up? Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming on, Brandon, our human trade machine. Uh, be sure to subscribe. The Raptors NBA podcast on all platforms and unsubscribe from anything you've currently been listening to because we are your source for all Raptors and basketball news. Thank you for listening and Merry Christmas and happy holidays.